Greetings and salutations, all you lovely individuals. We are back. It's League Unlock, Eric and Mark here with you for the final summer finals preview. After this weekend, I think we're going to have most, if not all, uh, I guess we still have the gauntlet to get figured out, but most of the finals done. So we'll have more uh, Worlds guys going. We got LCK and LCS this weekend. It's even basically the same format, three teams remaining. We're going to start over in South Korea, where the question is, are we legitimately just getting a script run back from the spring, spring playoffs? Because so far, it's gone the exact same way. Just need T1 to easily get past Hanwha again. You follow the bracket, you'd think it was exactly the same as the spring split playoffs. I don't think so. When you look at the results on the rift, that there's going that it's going to be the exact same as it was in spring. We're in for a bit of a different series, a different ball game when you're talking about this time, this matchup with Hanwha Life and T1. Of course, Hanwha Life coming off of a loss to Gen G, getting, you know, a, a, a little bit of an edge towards, the, you know, closer to that victory against a Gen G, but clearly a, a, a resounding response from Gen G that they are the undisputed number one team of the LCK. So here we get this matchup to say who's the number two who is the one that can be the challenger for them this summer split this is an intense matchup that we are looking at through and once again pick and ban is going to play a mighty important role in this series and you know we saw a little bit of a level up in that regard for t1 against d plus where they had a pretty convincing smooth 3-0 in that fashion, we were seeing them cook a little bit. The meta is starting to transition towards this crazy worlds patch, but we're pulling away from some of these AD mids. Baker's able to get back onto that comfort pick in the Azir, but for this matchup, I'm again. I know the Doran Zeus thing is always the thing to look at when those two go head to head, but I'm going right to the mid lane again as the key matchup in this one because you go back to that most recent series. And Zekka was styling on both Faker and T1 as a whole. I think it's an important thing to talk about that top lane matchup with Zeus and Doran and understand its impact and role in the series. But I agree that it doesn't actually matter if what's happening in the mid lane is the same as the last series where Zekka was able to create advantages, pressure and time, space for him to then start moving around the map, start exploiting some of these things, put that pressure on and not allowing Faker to have that effect for T1, that's a big thing because we know that he is absolutely, you know, there's other avenues to get that victory. But if that part of the engine, that cylinder isn't firing for T1, you're gonna have a lot of issues. If you're not getting that success in the mid lane and keeping things stable, that's gonna be a big part of it. And a big one is that champion pool for Zekka and how he exploits that a lot of the melee champions in the mid lane is certainly something the Yone, of course, is the very well-known pick that he likes to bring out in that mid lane and can be a difference maker in that matchup. Baker's going to have to step up, and whether that's going to be on that Azir pick that gives him that comfort, gives him that team playmaking ability, that's a possibility. The question is, again, how much do you want to invest into that, again, using that Azir pick when you know in the back of your minds that Azir is donezo. He's gonzo, dusted to bits in the patch coming up for Worlds. And, I mean, going further with the champ pool for Zeki, you mentioned the Yone. I'll throw in the Smolder as well. Two picks he just excelled on against T1. Those are two of the weakest picks Faker has had in the summer split. So there's definitely a bit of disparity in terms of what they're both playing right now. There's got to be some creativity coming through from T1, whether that is as far as just a strategy on how you deal with this from, Z excuse me, from Zeka, or whether it is as aggressive as champions, whether it is counter picks, these type of situations to see from Faker. I think that is one of those situations where, yes, a lot of the draft capital priority is usually spent towards someone like Zeus, possibly, you know, getting a, a last pick for Kyria even in the bottom side. I think we got to start putting some of that attention towards Faker and making sure that that matchup is going to be shored up. This is, of course, just the first course the real question is do either of these teams have a shot against gen g in the final and does one of them have a better chance than the other do you think does it play out differently if if you know if either hanwha life or t1 3-0 in such dominant fashion does that play out better than maybe if they have 
a really hard contested series here, but still eventually be that clear winner at the end of the day. I think even either of those scenarios for either team, you still got to roll with Gen G. That's just how dominant, how incredible of force they have been this year. Individual players in Chovy, in Pays, down in the bottom lane have been absolute game breakers. There's no way I see Gen G floundering this year. Yeah. Gen G just feels like all five members are in that flow state. And I feel like they can't <laughs> even go about their daily business because they can't escape this flow state everywhere they go. Like they're just playing things so perfectly, mechanics wise, movements around the map, everything is so on point for them. But yeah, I truly don't think it matters what fashion the series before ends in or who wins. Maybe I give Hanwa a slightly bigger edge. It just feels like here in summer, they seem more well put together on the same page, confident than they did in spring. And I have less faith in this version of T1 right now, just flipping a switch and turning things around. It feels like when you're feeling the pressure situation around the LCK, even with some pressure as far as not to be chokes, not to be frauds type of situation for how great you have been, Gen G has got the least amount of pressure compared to the rest of Hanwha Life and T1, who both have that pressure to need to improve, to show that next level, to take in that elite squad spot like a Gen G, like a BLG over in the LPL that you know is cooked up for Worlds. This is the time for T1 and Hanwha Life to take that next step, to show that next gear in that competition against each other, and hopefully the finals against Gen G. And obviously just this match before finals, huge implications. Winner is guaranteed at least the second seed heading to the world championship. The loser is going to be playing D plus in that gauntlet to hopefully qualify as that third seed. So plenty to play for before they even get to those grand finals. Similar angle over in the LCS, but things start a day earlier. I'm, I'm assuming Valorant scheduling got the Friday, Saturday <laughs> uh, for their grand final. But they're not even at the studios. What am I saying? They're at the big uh, YouTube venue still in LA. But 100 Thieves Fly Quest to kick things off. Um, this is a matchup we haven't had in playoffs. The last time these two played was over a month ago, and it was still Meech starting for 100 Thieves. Very different times now with Como starting down in the bottom lane for 100 Thieves. Just look back to the last series against Cloud9 for some of those examples for the type of difference that this roster is showing with Como in that position. Make no mistake, this is going to be a throwdown. I think a lot of people are, are underestimating 100 Thieves, no matter how much of a boost they got from beating Cloud9. It's a lot of people kind of going towards the negative side of Cloud9 for the reasons why that series went the way it did. Not enough credit in the positives for this 100 Thieves team. I think the big one for me, I'm not doubting the preparation. I think Golden Glue as a coach, he has got them prepared and locked in and focused and motivated for this next matchup for this whole weekend ahead of them if they can get by FlyQuest. And it really feels like since they lost in that upper bracket, they're playing so freely. You could see on the faces and even in interviews, maybe even leading up and around this, it was so much more tense for Cloud9. They had so much more expectations. It seems more strict, more serious. 100 Thieves. A lot of that is your boy Sniper's personality. Just always smiling goofy likable and that's what this 100 thieves roster has kind of been going through and now they're going to worlds through it so yeah they're going to be underdogs again but maybe eventually we'll stop doubting them they should still be underdogs uh fly quests have been i mean they played an incredibly competitive set against team liquid first time these two matched up uh sniper and whippo kind of traded blows they had some it was a Camille, Darius, Jax, a lot of carries in the top lane. I hope we get to see that again in this set. Fully expecting to get some spice in that top side, whether that's going to be a, a wacky pick from Whippo or if it's going to be a highly aggressive pick from someone like General Sniper. No more Renekton for Sniper. I, I, I can't handle any more of it. I've, I've got a sneaking suspicion we're going to see that croc oh. in this series. Either side of it, for Whippo or for General Sniper, I've got a feeling we're going to get it. I want to see other picks as well. I think that is where you can change things up. You can really get something in your favor if you're moving away from a more traditional standard flavor, as in Renekton, what we've been getting. But still, 
make no mistake, a very powerful flavor, that Redactin in the hands of a General Sniper or of Whippo with the way they're able to take it through these team fights. It's going to be about more than just that top side, though. We've got to take attention to that bottom lane because I think that this is going to be the real story. You already talked about how the last time these two teams played, this wasn't the bottom lane matchup. So it is different. Let's see it this time around. And obviously both guys, Masu being a rookie, Tomo, you know, he's he's got some time last split, but first real playoff pressure that they've had. So yeah, looking for these two young rookies where now it's becoming more and more AD carry centric as we're again slowly pivoting away. I know Quad uh, just had some insane Ziri performances last weekend. So we're not out of the 80s mid just quite yet, but a lot more emphasis on these bot laners. So two young guys, and honestly, whoever has a standout and steps up to the plate more, good chance their team's coming away with the series dub. Yeah, that's gonna be a, a real power position in this series. And the only other factor that I think can play into what is happening in that bottom lane, it's gonna be some trips, some visits, some vacations from the mid laners taking a little spot down to the bottom lane. Of course, that is Quid and Quad. Who's the better LCK prospect coming into the LCS? Let's find out. I can't wait for casters to mix up Quid and Quad over and over <laughs> as those two uh, go head to head. But similarly to the Gen G question, does it matter who wins? Is Team Liquid just going to beat either of them? Obviously, you feel like FlyQuest has the better odds because they had such a close competitive series in the, that upper bracket final. And you feel like Inspired's champion pool gives a bit of an advantage over to FlyQuest over TL. So FlyQuest is the easy answer for giving Team Liquid more, right? I, I think that has to be the easy answer. You can see the avenue for that. You can you know, picture it in your head real easy. 100 Thieves is going to take a lot more work to get to that type of situation that you're talking about it. But both of these teams, I think, can have that explosive angle, that different angle, and that willingness to challenge this top-level team in, a, in Team Liquid to make this more of a series. Now, is my faith in Team Liquid so strong that that type of series is always going to end up still 3-1 for Team Liquid? Yes. Yes, it will, no matter what. I think regardless, FlyQuest or 100 Thieves could level up to take a game, possibly two, to make this a, a full series into that Silver Scrapes. But I see no way Team Liquid is not exiting this weekend without that crown for the LCS region. And whoever goes as that two seed, you know, I've seen people saying 100 Thieves would really, you know, benefit from playing extra games in the play-in stage. And I'm not going to argue against that. Sniper at his first international, I mean, most of these guys, at their first international event, it would be great for them to get more games on stage to ramp up. But FlyQuest might also be looking for redemption from a play-in stage. Maybe, I, I mean, they're not going to play PSG, but uh, redemption from what happened to them at MSI. So I think either of these squads will benefit from playing through that play-in bracket. So number one, if you're the LCS, and if you're an LCS fan, regardless of what your actual team fan is here type of situation, you want Team Liquid to go as the number one seed. That has to be your strongest, most confident squad from the LCS. You'd be rolling with Team Liquid in that spot. And then for me, it really is that throw up. What do you want? Which one of these teams do you need to get that little bit of preparation, that little extra angle of experience? Is that 100 Thieves with so much of these young players on the roster and get this type of experience, exposure, and all these type of things? Or is it that angle of FlyQuest where you say, you know what, actually not all that questioned on 100 Thieves. I've still got doubts about FlyQuest still from MSI. They've been eased maybe a little bit with this spring split. Some of the bounce backs and individual performances where this roster seems to be on the trajectory. All those things. But you still got to prove it on the international stage. And if you have any doubts about FlyQuest, you want them as that third spot to get that little bit of extra challenge. Either way, these plans are always kind of a flip. You either go in confidently and leave with confidence because you deliver, or it's a scrape by, you struggle, barely limp your way in, and then you're going, and this isn't the main stage? Oh, we are doomed. If that is the avenue as it's going, if it's just you got to scrap and put it together type of thing, then you're looking at FlyQuest, I feel, at that point. Because, yes, you can talk about a little bit of the mental that you would maybe question from the MSI experiment, uh, but you would look at this team and some of the veteran players and, and trust how, especially a player like Whippo and Inspired, 
if they got to get it done, if they got to get down and dirty in the mud to really get across that finish line, I think you can count on it with this FlyQuest team. You wouldn't want to put uh, a more inexperienced squad like 100 Thieves in that type of situation. Doesn't matter if it's LCK or LCS. All we're praying for is competitive series over the weekends. Regardless who comes, we want at least one Game 5 banger in the LCK or the LCS. World's picture going to be even more fleshed out after this weekend. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out. We'll catch you on that flippity flip.